content warning. The following video contains descriptions and depictions of disturbing imagery, mental health, and suicide. Viewer discretion is advised. Also, Grant Morrison is non-binary and uses they, them pronouns. Please be respectful of that in the comments. Thanks, guys. <laughs> So last week's book covered a character that very few people actually knew was one of my favorites, and this week we're covering a book whose main character essentially made my platform. So, let's talk about it. Welcome back, everybody, to the Comic Book Book Club. I am your host, The Panda Red, the least famous Robin. How do I do this every single time? Its premise on its own has spawned arguably the most famous video game superhero franchise ever and the art style has scarred me for actual years. That's right, this week we are covering Batman Arkham Asylum a Serious House on Serious Earth by Grant Morrison and Dave McKean. Now, I have also read this book. I don't know how I keep getting books that are books that I have already read for the series that I pitched as reading all the books I haven't read. But just initial thoughts, things that I remember from reading it initially. Uh, the art style is haunting. The art style is, I, it's one of my favorites from a comic book, but it's also utterly terrifying to be perfectly honest. It has this sense of realism. It's very painterly style, which my favorite artist of all time in comic books is Alex Ross. So that's not exactly a problem for me. It is more along the lines of, it has a very sketchy painterly style, if I was to describe it. Uh, it. It looks painted, it looks realistic, but sometimes things are collaged together, sometimes things are just roughly sketched in, sometimes things look like they were taken with a camera that's overexposed. I'm looking at you, Joker. And if I remember correctly, when I read the story the first time, I was a little bit lost, um, but... I'm hoping that reading it now will actually be able to, to clear some of it up because I don't remember what age I was when I read this, but I remember that I wasn't as old as I am now. Grant Morrison does have a reputation as a comics writer. Uh, they are somebody who very much pulls from comics history, everything is canon and the like, but something that I have realized that they do when they're writing is very rarely are characters in pure shades of gray. They very much like the classic comic book feel of good guys and bad guys. They're not very much into to gray characters like anti-heroes or dark reimaginings of, of, of positive characters. They, they very much seem to, to operate in a realm where heroes are heroes and villains are villains, and that's the rules that they operate in. However, granted, the last Grant Morrison book that I read was all-star Superman so that's kind of where that book goes but there is an overwhelming sense of optimism to a lot of Grant Morrison's work so I am I am looking forward to seeing what this Batman story is like because I know that Morrison's other Batman run is both the one that introduced Damian Wayne and villainized Talia al Ghul forever but with all of the preamble out of the way I am going to be reading the uh, 25th anniversary edition which has a whole bunch of extras in the back of the book that I am also going to be reading just for more context over the entire thing so I'm gonna go and read this real quick I will be right back and we're gonna talk about it okay um, I just finished reading that story initial thoughts um, I'm so confused. Um, that story feels like you're reading someone else's dream journal. I'm not a hundred percent sure what happened entirely. I know some of the parts, like I know the basic plot of A to B what happened, but I, the stuff in the middle is very confusing. I really need to like read through the the script that's in the back of the book because the 25th edition came with a full script for the actual uh comic itself i'm probably going to do a little bit of research uh and then i'm going to write the synopses um but yeah i'm very very confused batman really doesn't act like batman in this book uh no none of the characters 
really act like themselves with the exception of like Mad Hatter. Um, yeah, I, I, I need to get, I need to get my thoughts straight about this book because I am, I am very confused right now after just reading it. I'm not 100% sure all of the events that have transpired. So I'm going to go and write the synopses and I'll be right back. Okay. All right. It is a few days later. I've read the script. I've done my research. I've written the synopses. Initial thoughts before I get into the actual, like, story synopses. It's gonna come across a little bit in how I talk about this book because I, even after researching it, I don't think I fully understand it. And I'm gonna get into a couple of the reasons as to why in the actual, like, explanation in the back half. This, this book is very heavily, 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 heavily written on the basis of metaphor. And the script is very densely layered with visual and uh, metaphorical symbolism. But the problem is, is that once it was edited and once the art was put into it, a lot of that symbolism got kneecapped or the, the, the middle of the symbol, like the meat of the symbolism got taken out. Um, so there, there's a lot of like metaphors that don't really have a point in the actual comic itself that do have a point in the script and that that is a very difficult thing to do i'm more saying this so that when you hear the frustration in my voice when i am like explaining the synopses it it is it, it's because i read the script and actually kind of understood some of it not all of it not even close to all of it but i did understand some of it um so let's get into the spoiler free synopsis first uh, and then we're going to get into the full spoiler synopsis afterwards. But before we get into either of those, let's first have a word from our sponsor. Hi, the sponsor is me. This video is not sponsored, so it will be sponsored by my Patreon. If you subscribe to my Patreon at a tier of $15 or higher, you will be able to vote on future episodes of this show that you're watching right now. I put out a vote at the end of every single episode on that Patreon that allows $15 patrons to vote on the comic that they want to see for the next episode. So if you want to be influential towards making this channel grow, if you want to be influential in the future of the series, then feel free to hop on over to my Patreon and donate $15 or more. You also get benefits like a patrons exclusive chat on my Discord server, as well as discounts on my merch store and multiple other little goodies that I sprinkle as I make these videos. So if you want to join the party, feel free to hop on over to my Patreon, the Panda Red at patreon.com and give me a look. All right, let's get into the actual synopsis now. All right, here is everything you need to know before you read Batman Arkham Asylum, A Serious House on Serious Earth. Number one, this book was originally published in 1989, only three years after Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns, and apparently acts as kind of a response to the newly popular uber-realistic superhero story that those two books popularized. Number two, the Batman in this book is specifically written to be as tightly strung as he has ever been. He is at his psychological breaking point. Morrison had specifically said in their author's note that this is not how they would write the character otherwise. This version is supposed to be a critique of the quote, violent driven and borderline psychopathic version of the character that had become popular at the time. Thanks Frank Miller. He will say and do things that are not in keeping with Batman's normal characterization, and that is the point. Number three, the story is intentionally supposed to be very dreamlike and metaphorical, with the story being described by Morrison as possibly being a nightmare that Batman has had one night. Number four, Morrison originally wanted artist Brian Boland to do the artwork, most famous for The Killing Joke, and ultimately clashed with the artist that he got, who is Dave McKean, on many aspects of the visuals and the story. Number five. Many of the themes and visuals tie back to things like tarot, Jungian psychology, Alice in Wonderland, and various other classical and psychological works none of which I have the time or energy to research for this video, so I am sorry if the metaphors go over my head. Number six. This is just a fun fact, honestly. This book was being written before the death of Jason Todd had been decided, which I just kind of think is a little neat. Number seven. 
this book greatly confused the hell out of me when I read it, and it still confuses me now. God, I hope this video doesn't suck. Alright, now that you know all of the information that you need to know before getting into the actual synopsis, let's synopsize the story without any spoilers, which is going to be very difficult because this is a very interconnected story. The inmates are loose in Arkham Asylum. Joker has taken hostages and will trade them in exchange for Batman. Batman descends into the madhouse, confronting his own mental state and uncovering how and why the asylum fell into such a state of anarchy. Intercut with this are vignettes of the life of Amadeus Arkham, the founder of the asylum, showing the story behind his creation and eventual admission into his own house of care, all from his own words as we read from his journal. I wish that I was lying when I say that that is really all I can say without delving into like major spoilers for the actual story. So without further ado, here is the story of Arkham Asylum, a serious house on serious earth. Okay, so here is how I'm going to do this. The story of Arkham Asylum is split into two halves that play out simultaneously. These being the story of Batman as he makes his way through the asylum, encountering enemies and questioning his own sanity, and the story of Amadeus Arkham, chronicling his life story from his childhood to his eventual admission and death as a patient of his own asylum. In the book, these stories are cut together, feeding and echoing each other both in theme and story. Now. If I was setting out to give a completely accurate retelling, I would tell you the events in the order they are told in the book. However, not only is this book already confusing enough as it is, but my goal is not to give a completely faithful retelling of the entire book. I am giving you a summary so we can talk about the book afterwards. If you want the story exactly as it was told, almost every library I have ever been to has a copy of this graphic novel, or you can always just buy it. <coughs> Support the comic book industry. <coughs> so. Instead, what I am going to do is tell you the two stories separately, first going through the life of Amadeus, and then going through Batman's journey through the Asylum. We'll talk about the similarities and how they connect in the discussion segment afterwards. Got it? Okay, let's go. From the Journals of Amadeus Arkham, 1901. A young Amadeus walks the halls of his family's huge estate, bringing his widowed mother a plate of food and some tea. She is not well and by the state of her, it is obvious that she has not been for some time. When he offers her the food, she says through stuffed mouth that she has already eaten. When her mouth opens, a shower of beetles falls from her mouth. Amadeus drops the plate in frozen horror, and she starts to panic, holding up her hands in front of her face in a shape vaguely resembling a bat. Amadeus will later say, that given the beetle's significance as a sign of protection, his mother, in her own way, was trying to protect herself from something in the only way she knew how. 1920. Amadeus returns to his family's estate after the funeral of his mother's death by suicide. Amadeus has inherited the estate and land and now plans to make it an asylum to help prevent the kind of suffering his mother went through. His dreams are haunted by the sound of beating wings. The next day, he returns to Metropolis where he and his family live and treats one of his patients, a mentally ill serial killer by the name of Mad Dog Hawkins. After their conversation, Amadeus is sure of his plan for the asylum. During the renovation of the house into the asylum, his daughter begins to suffer nightmares. And in the fall of that year, Amadeus meets both Carl Jung and Alistair Crowley on a trip to Switzerland. Upon his arrival back home, he receives a phone call that Mad Dog has escaped prison. April 1st, 1921. While Arkham is not home, Mad Dog breaks in and murders Amadeus' wife and daughter, whose bodies he discovers upon his return. In a methodical daze, Amadeus puts on his mother's wedding dress and simply kneels down in the room where he found their bodies. That night, he starts to think he might be ill. November, 1921. The Elizabeth Arkham Asylum for the Criminally Insane opens its doors, one of the first patients being the freshly re-caught Mad Dog Hawkins. April 1st, 1922. One year to the day after his family's murder, 
Amadeus straps Hawkins to the electroshock couch and runs it until Hawkins is dead. Amadeus feels nothing. It is all treated like an accident. 1922. Amadeus wanders the halls of the asylum at 3 a.m., what is now a routine task for him. There is a secret room that he visits where he keeps his journal up to date. He is convinced that he can hear laughter from a cell that he knows is empty. He tapes over the mirror in his study, which seems to stop the laughing in his mind. The asylum is like an organism to him, hungry for madness, a maze that dreams which he is lost in. Some time later, Arkham's friends take him to the opera in an attempt to help his waning health. After watching Wagner's Parsifal, Arkham returns home, his health having not improved. He tries to self-medicate by ingesting mushrooms, which, after a short delay, kick in. Arkham has a bad trip. Running through the halls of the asylum, hearing voices, seeing keyholes bleed, doors opening and slamming shut, he finds himself in his study where he rips the tape from his mirror in a mad dash. Upon looking into what he sees as his mother's eyes in his head, he faints, waking up the next morning dazed. In his waking confusion, he unlocks a memory his mind had hidden from him. His mother did not commit suicide in 1920. He killed her to spare her from her madness. She had delusions of a terrifyingly large bat demon coming to get her. A delusion that, moments before he took her life, Amadeus seemed to share, seeing the demon in her room. Madness is in his blood. It is his inheritance. Donning his mother's wedding dress once again, Amadeus swears that he will contain the presences that roam these rooms and narrow stairways. 1929. Amadeus attempts to kill his stockbroker, being locked away in the very asylum that he built. For his remaining years in confinement, he studies the occult, trying to find a way to seal away the bat creature that he thinks looms over the asylum. Eventually scrawling the binding spell on the floor of his cell with nothing but his fingernails. As soon as he finishes, he falls to his back, dying, whole and complete and free at last in Arkham. I'm home, where I belong. Yeah, I bet you forgot this was a Batman story after all that, huh? Well, let's get back to the superheroics and put the creepy mid-century gothic thriller in our back pocket for right now. It's the modern day, and by the modern day, I actually mean April 1st, 1989. We really had to do this one month late in May, huh? There has been a riot at Arkham Asylum, and the inmates have taken over. Their final demand coming from the Joker himself, saying that Batman needs to come in there with them. And in exchange, they'll give over all their hostages. Batman voices his concerns in private to Commissioner Gordon that he's worried about what will happen when he goes in there. He's worried that the Joker is right, and that he's just as insane as the people he puts away. That when he goes into that asylum, it'll be just like coming home. Upon arriving at Arkham Asylum, Batman realizes that the building is encircled in salt before being met at the door by the Joker, rocking the most horrifying design I have ever seen! What the hell, Dave McKean? What is this? Anyway, he releases the hostages and takes Batman inside. We meet two people who are not inmates, but doctors here, both having refused to leave until this situation is resolved. The first is Dr. Cavendish, the current administrator that has a quote-unquote guilty secret that the Joker apparently knows, and is apparently rather fond of ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy. 
The second is a psychotherapist by the name of Ruth Adams. Under a table, we also meet what remains of Two-Face, who has been weaned off of his coin onto a deck of tarot cards. While this was done to give him more freedom from the binary he lived his life by, it has instead resulted in him being so frozen by indecision that he can't even make a simple choice like whether to go to the bathroom or not. While Dr. Adams explains this to Batman, they begin to discuss the Joker. Considering the possibility of him not being insane, but rather super sane. Before Joker corners them with a Rorschach test, and asks Batman what he sees. Batman, seeing a bat, but lying, and saying that he sees nothing. Not satisfied, Joker makes Dr. Ruth give Batman a word association test. It goes... badly. The Joker is satisfied. And besides, it's time to start his game. Batman has until midnight to find four of his rogues before they start to hunt him. Scarecrow, Clayface, Dr. Destiny, and Killer Croc are somewhere in the asylum, and Batman needs to find them all before midnight. Batman tries to refuse, but Joker simply kills a security guard, who has apparently been here the whole time, before pointing his gun at Dr. Adams and telling Batman to run because he only has one hour. All right, it's a pretty stock standard Batman story so far, right? Right. Well, here we go off the deep end. <laughs> Not two minutes into the game, Batman starts to hallucinate about the death of the Waynes, a hallucination that is so powerful, Batman smashes a mirror and uses one of the shards of glass to stab through his own why? Dave, why? Dave McKean, why did you do this? I needed to read this. Why? <sighs> Joker also says screw it and just lets everyone go after Batman, even though it's only been 10 minutes. Which, by the way, apparently that room that they were in had all of the rogues in there. It wasn't just the four of them in the asylum. And I only figured this out after reading the script. We then see what is supposed to be Clayface, which I also had to literally read the script to figure out, walking down a hall with the words, The Tunnel of Love, etched into it. Okay, I need to go on a quick tangent here before we continue. These next few pages confused the shit out of me every single time that I read them, because Batman seemingly becomes nothing more than a crazed serial killer until, like, damn near the end of the book. Apparently, Clayface in this version is supposed to be like a walking disease that corrupts and infects, whose touch alone carries an instant contagion. AIDS on two legs, as Morrison put it. The art really betrays these metaphors because it is so abstract that while the off-putting mood is expertly delivered, a lot of the visual symbolism or visual storytelling that Morrison was going for is just completely lost. All of Batman's encounters in this section are supposed to be metaphors for Batman's various mental states, with Clayface specifically supposed to be representative of Batman's fear of sexuality, hence the Tunnel of Love, as something that is intrinsically unclean. Morrison also wants to establish that this is a Batman distilled down to his essence, a vengeful, violent, nightmare figure, a primal force that knows no more mercy than a hurricane. So until the end of the book, just know that this is all a metaphor for something or a showcase of Batman's essential inhuman brutality. Okay? Okay. Anyways, Clayface shambles towards Batman, reaching out his hand and wanting to, quote, share his disease. Batman responds by essentially kicking his leg in half. He then finds Dr. Destiny, who is looking for Clayface because he apparently pushes Destiny's wheelchair for him. Batman 
kicks his wheelchair down the stairs. It is unclear if they are both unconscious or if Batman just straight up murdered two people. We then see Scarecrow shambling down the hallway with a pitchfork. Batman hides in an empty cell until Scarecrow passes and realizes in astonishment that the cell's floor has been meticulously carved into. Some sort of script is covering the floor. Batman moves on, coming across the Mad Hatter behind a pane of glass smoking a hookah. If this story parallels Alice in Wonderland, as I am told it does, again, I have not read a full novel in preparation for this book review, then Jervis here is meant to be our caterpillar. In a very confusing fashion, he spells out that the rogues gallery are all metaphors for Batman's many sides and traumas mentality that this book plays with a lot before Batman moves on again. The next of the rogues that we encounter is Maxi Zeus in the electroconvulsive therapy room, which is yet another thing I only know because I read the script. And to be honest, nothing really happens here. I'm assuming Maxi's supposed to represent Batman's underlying god complex, but even the script didn't clear up why this is here, so much like Batman does, we're just gonna move on again. Batman sees blood on the ground. And when he goes to investigate, Killer Croc attacks him from behind. He beats the hell out of Batman and throws him through a window into the courtyard. Batman sees a statue of the Archangel Michael that Amadeus Arkham had installed back in the initial renovation of the manor and takes its spear. He attacks and impales Killer Croc with it, inadvertently impaling himself as well. The spear being worn down by rust, again, another thing I only learned because it's in the script, the spear breaks, Croc being thrown through the window behind him, again, dead or unconscious, dealer's choice, and Batman is left alone to rip the huge spear from the meat of his side. Batman follows the blood again, which leads him to a fake wall. He punches the wall in, and inside he finds Dr. Cavendish, if you remember who that was from a couple of minutes ago, that was the guy from the beginning that had, like, a page, maybe, of screen time? Well, Doc Cavendish is dressed in Mama Arkham's wedding dress, and has Dr. Adams hostage with a straight razor. It turns out, he's the one who let the inmates free, and demands that Batman read Amadeus' journal to find out why. Cavendish believes that Batman is the Bat Demon that Amadeus wrote about, and that he's fed this hungry house with souls for years. He found the journal a few years ago and felt that it was his destiny, his responsibility, to finish what Amadeus started. He started the riot. He was the one that poured the salt circle outside of the asylum so that Batman couldn't get out, so that the Bat couldn't get out, and now he's gonna kill that bat once and for all, slashing at Batman with the razor. Batman disarms him, but Cavendish is able to get his hands around Batman's neck and begins to choke the life out of him. Batman begs for Adams to do something, and in a blind fury, she picks up the straight razor and slices Cavendish's throat. She is obviously very upset about this. But Batman seems to not really care, simply stating that he got what he deserved, before asking about the way out. Leading Adams to the exit, Batman, simply ignoring her obvious state of shock, asks for Two-Face coin back, before turning back and going into the asylum to show them that he's stronger than them. He's stronger than this place. Batman, grabbing an axe, chops at... Stuff? Seriously, the script doesn't really specify a given target. It's just like a window and some doors. He, he's literally just wrecking house. This is, again, a metaphor for a reference that you need to be, like, paying attention to find out. 
scaring the hell out of the inmates. Eventually, Batman kicks in the door to the room where Joker and the other inmates are, throwing the axe at the Joker's feet. He declares that all of the inmates are free. This is supposed to be more metaphorical than anything. Think like spiritually free, because he just fucked up the demon house. Anyway, uh, Joker says that they all know that. He asks if Batman has come here to die. And Batman says that they should let Two-Face decide. Much to the Joker's amusement. Batman tosses Two-Face back his coin. And after a moment, Two-Face says that Tails, Batman dies right here. But heads, Batman goes free. He flips the coin, looks at it in his hand. And he says that Batman can go. Joker walks him to the door. Enjoy yourself out there in the asylum. We look back to Harvey's coin, tails side up in his hand. As he knocks over the House of Tarot cards he ruled his life by that morning. Who cares for you? You're nothing but a pack of cards. And that is Batman, Arkham Asylum, a serious house on serious earth. Am I just too dumb for this book? I'm I'm being fully honest right now. There is so many metaphors to things that I can't even think of. There, there's so many metaphors to outside or supplemental material that are pretty essential for the understanding of this book that I'm wondering if I'm just not well read enough to understand this story. Because there are a lot of metaphorical concepts that Morrison brings up. There's a lot of things that, that they say in the actual story itself that I don't understand. <laughs> I really wish that I got this book better. After reading the script, it really became a lot more obvious what was supposed to be happening. Um, the finished comic is not the story that was written. It has very, very bright similarities, but the fact that the art is so abstract and that a lot of the metaphors and big things that Morrison wanted to do got cut out, it makes it so that the finished story doesn't really make a lot of sense. There are a lot of things that Morrison writes in the script that are simply not on the page. Or there are, there are scenes that are dependent on other scenes that are not in the actual book. One of the things that comes to mind for that is the fact that I had no idea who Clayface was until this reading. Because the Clayface in this book is so fundamentally different from any other interpretation of Clayface that I would have never put A and B together. People say that Clayface is in the asylum. After we see this version of Clayface, Dr. Destiny is looking for him and does not find him. But I always just kind of thought that that meant that Clayface like got out or wasn't there. I just thought it was weird that he wasn't in there. But I don't really understand this version of Clayface because he is never shown before the exact second he shows up completely unnamed. Things like that. There's a, there's a scene that Morrison writes about in the script that was supposed to happen where there's like a lineup of all of the the rogues that are going to be present in the book and it doesn't really fit in terms of theme and it feels a little weird that they're just all standing there but it does kind of help introduce these completely altered versions of the characters and that happens a lot there are a lot of things that morrison talks about in the script that are very referential of things on a very psychological level, on a very well-read level. There's a lot of research that obviously goes into this book. I was discussing this book on my Twitch chat, which by the way, uh, I stream almost every single week. Feel free to hop on over to Twitch and, and, and find me there, The Panda Red. It's the exact same as it is here, but also on Twitch. I was discussing this comic with my Twitch chat and somebody brought up the fact that they, they are not a fan of Morrison's writing 
because Morrison doesn't seem to do their homework, and I think it's the exact opposite. I think that Morrison does too much homework. <laughs> there are multiple things in this that are direct references to Len Wein's DC Who's Who entry on Arkham Asylum, which I have never read, but are only you can only really pick up on the fact that though that those are are references if you have read that before. And also Morrison gets the things wrong. Like in, in DC's Who is Who, it said that Amadeus Arkham died singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, when in this book he dies singing the Star Spangled Banner, which Morrison- Scottish. I'm not gonna fault them for not knowing American song lyrics. That's not a problem. It's just when when there's so much metaphor built on top of itself here, it, it kind of crumbles the second that something isn't fully correct. But that also exists in tandem with the rest of the book that is extremely thought out, extremely read up on. There are symbols that reappear multiple times in the book that if you don't know the importance of them in like symbology, numerology, if you if you don't know the importance of them in, in the world outside of the book, then it's just gonna seem kind of weird. Which, which also brings me to another thing that kind of confuses me about this book. <sighs> The world that Morrison has created seems completely original. I understand that this is supposed to act as a critique of the late 80s, early 90s Batman, which is sort of this fascistic, jackbooted thug who is borderline psychotic and and just 100% devoted to the mission. This is, a, this is a critique of the Dark Knight Returns Batman. This is the critique of, of that early 90s, I am justice sort of Batman. And I get that, but it doesn't establish itself in the beginning that way, which I can also very much blame on the artwork. And I don't want that to be me bashing on the artwork. Half the reason I originally bought this book is because I thought the art was amazing. The art in this is very uh, impressionistic. It's very abstract. It gets across the vibe of what's happening very, very well. When I said that this feels like reading someone's dream journal. I mean that because the art very much feels like a dream, which I can tell is the point. It's the point that this is not supposed to be literal. It's not supposed to be in your face and, and explain everything to you. It's supposed to be very symbolic of what's going on and not actually showing you what's going on. And I can understand that and I get that. But there are things that only work in the script if they are spelled out visually that are not spelled out in this uh, in this version. For instance, one of the things that Morrison says very early on in their script is a, a visual description of Batman that they even write in the annotations was thrown out as soon as Dave McKean decided to draw draw Batman differently. Here it is. This is the the visual description of what Batman was supposed to look like in this story to explain how, how, how tightly strung he is throughout the entire thing. The portrayal of Batman here and throughout is quite important. His posture reveals a man constantly on the defensive, constantly expecting attack from some quarter. His body is a fortress of flesh, bulwarked against the ravages of a merciless world. Consequently, he stands perfectly straight to the point of stiffness. We can imagine his walking with his buttocks clenched. He is the posture of an obsessive, anal personality. This Batman is a frightened, threatened boy who has made himself terrible at the cost of his own humanity. He is completely incapable of any kind of sexual relationship. He has made himself hard and domineering in order that he might never be hurt or abandoned again. Only in action does his rigidity relax, and then Batman becomes a fluid shadow. That is a very, very in-depth description of how Batman is supposed to stand and move and act that we are supposed to see visually. He is supposed to be very stiff, very, very sturdy. He is supposed to be so stiff and unmoving that it is obvious that he is not comfortable at any time. That he is a very, very, I don't want to say self-aware person, but a very, very self-conscious person. He, he is very aware of how he is standing. He's very aware of everything in his surroundings. And he is always, always, always just on, on the breaking point, always snapping. In, in Morrison's annotations, they expand on it by saying much of the body language required for this particular depiction of Batman was omitted from the art when Dave chose to render Batman more impressionistically as a hunched, ambiguous figure. I feel like that is 
almost at a detriment to the entire story because this story feels very much like Morrison created a hypothetical parody, not a humorous parody, but a, a parody of Batman, a critique of the 80s and 90s version of Batman that had become so popular. And central to that critique is Batman's portrayal in the book. And the entire book is based around having his villains be emblematic of the different sides of this Batman. But then in the actual creation, they nixed actually showing this version of Batman and made him a lot more of a original style shadow. And I feel like that kind of lessens the entire impact of the story. Because if you don't read that annotated script in the back, Batman just acts weird this entire story. He looks really cool. He's this giant shadow for like 90% of the story. The Dave McKean actually does this really cool thing that throughout the book, Batman and his costume merge more and more and more. At the very beginning, you can see like the separation between his mask and his face. But by the very end, Batman and Bruce Wayne are just merged. His skin is now blue because it merges into the mask. There's no separation between the different parts of it. Batman is just this creature by the very end of it. And I think that's very, very cool, but that's that's not what the story is trying to imply. The story is trying to imply the story of a man and his psychological deterioration because of what he does and who he is. Um, it, it's supposed to be confronting the psychology of Batman by turning Batman's usual personality, or at least what it was in the time that this book was released, up to 11 and then critiquing it. But because of the way that the art portrays him, you get very confused. Batman tells the Joker, get your filthy hands off of me, which is just very weird. Batman's favorite word in this is Jesus. Like he, he stabs a, a piece of glass through his hand. And when he say, when he does that, he just like, screams, like Jesus. Um, he begs for help from a civilian to kill the bad guy, which if you read the script, again, is Morrison adding a, a, a metaphor onto the characters of Dr. Cavendish and uh, Ruth Adams that are supposed to be the two sides of Batman's personality, fighting it out, and he's begging for help from uh, one side of his personality to help take out the other side. But again, if you don't know that, then it's just, Hey, remember that character that we introduced at the very beginning showed for like, I don't know, six frames throughout the entire book. A and now he's the bad guy. Well, Batman is so scared of him that he is going to beg a civilian to kill him. Th that's weird. That feels weird when reading it. Morrison admits in their annotations that, that they're pretty sure that the reason that this book might have taken off is because it released at the exact same time as the Batman movie that came out, the, the Michael Keaton Batman movie. And I don't want to blame this book's success on that. The art is gorgeous. The art is beautiful. The story, to a certain extent, is followable. It just portrays all of the characters very strangely. And I can see why this book is successful because it has a very impressionistic and very artistic version of Batman and his rogues and his story. I just don't, I don't really get it. There is, there's so, so many metaphors in this book. I released a list to my patrons. It is labeled as the big ass list of shit you need to know, have read, have seen, or understand to get all of the references and metaphors in this story as according to the author's notes of a one Grant Morrison. And I went through the entire script and I wrote down every single time Morrison goes into detail about uh, a reference or a metaphor or how certain things are supposed to relate to other, th other things. And I wrote it all down. And the list is surprisingly long. Uh, it's, it ranges from things like split brain theory. There's a very specific poem that the subtitle of the book is based after. There's one double page spread where every single voice bubble is a reference to something different. There's just, there's just so much in this book that I feel like it kind of drowns under the weight of all of its metaphors. All of the metaphors get so confused and muddied and mixed together 
that it's kind of hard to, to understand what's going on or what anything is supposed to mean. The, the, the easiest story to follow in this is Amadeus Arkham's story. And even then, there are things from Amadeus Arkham's story that got cut out, that got changed. There's a, there's a scene that Morrison ended up cutting uh, when when Arkham finds his family and kneels down, it says that he throws up later. And and that's because Morrison originally wrote it as Arkham cannibalizes the remains of his family because it's supposed to be a, a reference to shamanistic practices of people that used to eat their dead as, as a form of honoring them. And, and they ended up cutting that out because of course they should. But they left in everything surrounding it. So Arkham just kind of kneels down and then throws up later, which is like, that's, that's, a, that's a reasonable, in, in that moment, that is a very reasonable explanation of events. But there's multiple times that things just, you need to have had the actual metaphor for it to be explained. One of the metaphors that gets extremely confusing is there's a lot of Christ imagery that is that is thrown on to batman especially for the fact that this batman is supposed to be a somewhat of a critique it's very strange to me that there is so much christ imagery that goes on to batman him destroying the house at the end of it it's supposed to be a uh, part of the the new testament where he 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 sacks a church and also a reference to hell's harrowing which is a, a, a theory that was really big in the Middle Ages that when Jesus died, he went into hell and like trashed the place to show that he was stronger than it. At least I think that's what it is. Again, I am not a religious person, but there is a lot of imagery of Christ that is put on to Batman. A lot of very angelic and holy. And when he says, I am just a man in response to, to Cavendish, there is a fucking picture of Christ right behind him. And I feel like that metaphor doesn't really make sense with the way that Batman has been portrayed throughout this entire book. Morrison writes that by the end of it, Batman is supposed to basically become the version of Batman that we know, and he becomes the hero at the end of it, and then through the, the middle of it, he has descended into what is essentially hell. He has descended into a dream world that nothing makes sense and no logic exists. So he's this dark, demonistic creature until he conquers uh, the bat demon and, and merges with it and, and, and moves on and grows by the end of it. And I just don't see that. <laughs> it, it feels very much like the, the book starts, Batman is acting like Batman, he's talking a little weird. He doesn't really talk like Batman and, hey commissioner, what's up? That feels a little weird. But then he goes to the asylum, is like really hands-offish with the Joker. And then there's the middle section where he questionably murders three of his villains. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. Uh, the entire reason that there is a script in every version of this story printed after 2005. There, the reason that there's a script in the back of the book is because when the book was originally released, people really, really liked the the art. And that was what they were they were praising, is because the art was really good, but they didn't really understand the story. And they thought it was way too bogged down by metaphors. So Morrison went, okay, if, if I print the script in every future version of the book, then there's no way that people will miss all of the metaphors because they'll be able to see all of the metaphors. I'll even put my annotated version of the script in there so I can explain all of it. And even then, I read through both both parts of it. I, I don't wholly get it. I'm also not very read up on Jungian psychology and and Freudian psychology and the works of Aleister Crowley. I I have not read all of the things that are on that list on the big ass list of shit you need to read. So I'm 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 left confused by the book. I think that the art is really good. I think that the art does a lot of very interesting things, but I also think that the art was not built for this book. I feel like it was built for the mood of it, but for the extremely layered, dense, metaphorical story that's being told, I don't feel like it fits because it it muddies a lot of the things that, that are meant to be shown much again I'll, I'll always keep going back to clayface because clayface was the the most confusing part in the script it says that clayface is dragging his hand on the wall and when he's dragging his hand on the wall you can see the paint boil and bubble and and crack and fall away it's obvious that his hand is corrupting and diseasing the wall anything that he touches does that uh there's a scene where he reaches out to batman and he misses him but he touches his arm and when it hits his arm, uh, Batman's suit immediately dissolves exactly where it touched, 
and his skin uh, bubbles and boils and, and uh, cysts form and burst on his arm immediately. Like, it's really obvious that, that you don't want to be touched by this version of Clayface. But in the book, in the actual art, Clayface is dragging his hand on the wall and there's just a white streak behind it. And that's it. Clayface just looks like a really, really sick guy. And Batman, who is supposed to... Like, he's supposed to be, you know, big, scary, evil dude, but he's not supposed to be ruthless towards his villains. I mean, there's a reason he puts them in an asylum and not prison. It's because he wants them to get better. It's because he believes in them. Uh, and he believes in the ability that, that everybody deserves a second chance. Nobody deserves to, to die or be thrown away. Everybody deserves to at least have a chance to better themselves. Batman in this version sees Clayface's, don't touch me, don't touch me. And the second that Clayface reaches for him, he like kicks him so hard his leg snaps in half. And that was such a brutal visual for me that I'm so very confused as to, as to the meaning of it. I know it's supposed to show that Batman is brutal, but this is, it's excessive. It's excessive even for the metaphor that they're trying to get across because it doesn't fit with the metaphor they're trying to get across. They want us to see Batman as this sort of Christ figure, but also see him as this demonistic hell beast that is just fear incarnate that, that goes after all of his villains. I don't know if I can recommend this book outside of like, you wanna see it because the art is really cool, or you might just be smarter than me. This is a very critically acclaimed book. It's been a bestseller. It's gotten a bunch of anniversary editions. It's a famous Batman story, and it is for a reason. A lot of people regard this as one of the best Batman stories, and I'm not gonna deny them that. I will say that I don't understand it. I will say that the the level of metaphor, the level of 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 big thoughts and thinking that goes into this book is more than I can understand. So I don't know if I can recommend this book on anything other than do you want a Batman story that's visuals are so impactful because they really deliver in that sense of creepiness that Arkham Asylum is supposed to invoke. I don't know if I can recommend it outside of that. But if that's what you want, go nuts. If you're smarter than me and you actually like have the ability to understand this book, I'm so happy for you. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying the metaphors aren't there i'm saying i don't understand them before i wrap this up this this book very infamously inspired uh the arkham series the arkham asylum series it inspired the first game very heavily all of the inmates are loose jokers in charge and it inspired that series and there is a video essay that i watched it's very long three hours long by the youtuber micah edmonds that i'm going to link in the description of this video the critiques levied in that video essay can also be levied at this book because near the end of that essay and and in fact one of the the main points throughout the entire essay is that while being set in an asylum it villainizes everyone inside of it it villainizes everyone that is a part of the system of an asylum, which is a caregiving place. And the, the games themselves don't really comment on the treatment of the mentally ill. It does not make statements on the, the treatment of the mentally ill or, or anything in favor of the mentally ill. The mentally ill are, ju are just villains to defeat. And I feel like this, this book also leans into that because the seconds the inmates gets loose in the asylum, Everything goes to hell and all of them are monsters and evil and bad. And I feel like a lot of the critiques levied near the end of that video, uh, specifically in the section titled Rosemary, I feel like those critiques can be leveled very much against this book and they very succinctly carry over a lot of the, the points that I feel also fit into this book. So if you have the time and if you are like me and love watching multi-hour long video essays, I would say go and watch it. I highly recommend it. I really like that video. And I feel like a lot of its critiques are very well warranted. Otherwise, I think that is going to wrap up my critique for Batman Arkham Asylum, a serious house on serious earth. I have already had the vote for the next video that is going to be coming out and the 
Winner by a fair margin is going to be Batman Year One by Frank Miller. I, I, I'm i gonna be honest, I'm probably not gonna put a Batman book on the next vote because uh, if I do, I can almost guarantee that every video I do is going to be a Batman video and I want to experiment with other characters a little bit. But thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for sticking around. I am excited to get into a book that actually has a movie based on it so I can talk about that a little bit more. And... I will see you guys next time. And that is going to be it for this time. Thank you guys so very much for watching. I just want to take a moment to thank all of my lovely, lovely patrons over on Patreon. Amanda Barnstead, Andrew Lanowitz, Background Joshua, Bill Bro, Brandon Bilbrey, Brandon Laney, Carol Cowett, Christopher Bosgard, Danny Walker, Dark Nimbus, Devaniculus, Dee Dee, Dragon Fang, Fireball Sensei, Gas Boss Gate Light Girl Keep, Have a Heart Tin Man, Jacob Safel, Jeffrey of Isles, Caitlin Kelly, Cat Q, Katie Hawkins, King Zalgo, Magu, Max Baker, Nixie Shimo, Pandora A, Pinchy Mugre, Raymond Villasana, Righteous Duke, Ricky Tiki Davi, Tangled Web, The Brain Teaser, The Holy Corota, Thomas Randolph, Toy Box, T.S. Famder, Ultraviolet, and Wofu Badge 2, as well as all of my other lovely, lovely, lovely patrons over on Patreon. I did want to take a moment in the credits here to let you guys know that this video and all of the research that I had to go into it has really been eye-opening on the amount of time I need to make these videos. So I am going to be adjusting my schedule from being one every two weeks to just I make these videos twice a month. There will be two of these videos a month. That's the way simpler way to put it. I'm gonna try and stick to as close to two weeks as possible, but if I don't make it, I don't make it. But there will be two of these videos every month regardless. I also wanted to take a moment to shout out two other YouTubers on top of Micah Edmonds that really did help with researching this video, and those would be Owen Likes Comics and Matt Draper. I watched both of their video essays on this book in preparation for this video just to help understand what is going on and their videos really really helped me i really really enjoyed them and i think you guys would too so if you guys have the time go check out micah edmonds owen likes comics and matt draper's videos on this book and with all that said and out of the way that is going to wrap up this video thank you guys for watching thank you guys for sticking around and i will see you next time